Jesus is the reason for the season that Jesus came to die for us, came to die for all of us because we are sinners, but because of Jesus' amazing grace, because of his sacrifice for our sin, we can all be forgiven, and that's such wonderful news that we can pray. We thank you and we praise you. Continue to work and move and speak to us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today, I know this morning we have several that are home. They're under the weather. We have the you know cold and flu season, right, going on this time of year. But I will tell you this, that will not stop grandparents and aunts and uncles from coming next Sunday uh, to watch the kids perform the Christmas play. And uh, uh, So we're looking forward to a great day uh, for that program uh, next Sunday. So plan on coming. Invite folks to come. And uh, I don't know about you, I just like to watch the kids when they mess up right? Uh, so adorable. It's just a lot of fun. And, and uh, so I told her, really, don't worry if, they, if the kids mess up some of their lines. I said, we, we enjoy uh, watching the kids and we're looking forward to that uh, next Sunday. Your Bibles are open now, Ephesians chapter number four. So we come now to our fourth and final part of, of this chapter. And of course, as Paul is talking about renewed thinking, of course, we, we understand from what Paul said back in verse 23, where he says to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So when you are renewed in the spirit of your mind, that leads us to renewed living. And uh, for, uh, for the next several verses after 23, Paul has been going on uh, one list, at, one item after the other about what we are to put on and what we are to put off. And so that's the idea of renewed thinking. It is when you are renewed in the spirit of your mind that you know what you are to put off and what you are to put on. So as Paul has given these specific things, if you'll just take a, a, a step back and observe, you'll notice that in all of the things to which Paul uh, describes that we are to put on or put off, they all have one thing in common, and that is our relationship with others, how we take care and how we view other people. In fact, it is so important, it's so paramount that, you know, when we understand that a relationship with Jesus Christ has an impact in the way that we treat and view others. So much so that the way in which you relate to others or treat others can actually grieve the Holy Spirit. And that's what Paul is talking about here. This verse, verse 30, has not been placed here haphazardly or incidentally, but under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as it connects the truth that the way that we treat one another can grieve the Holy Spirit. And I hope that when we get to that verse this morning, we'll understand how that applies to our life today. So as we close out this section of living, I'd like for us to look at these particular verses, verse 30 through 32 this morning. But before we look into this final part of renewed living, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, I just pray right now that you would just captivate our hearts, our minds, Lord, may we not be distracted by what we're going to be doing today or this week or what's coming up in a couple of weeks. The Lord, that right here and right now, that our hearts will be in tune with your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to learn of this passage, what it means and how it might apply to our lives. And Lord, in advance, we'll give you the praise and the glory for what is accomplished today. We pray in Christ's name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Notice, first of all, if you would, I want us to see the sorrow we must avoid. Number one, the sorrow we must avoid. He says in verse 30, or verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. He says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. So Paul is drawing attention here to the fact that the very Holy Spirit, the third member, the third person of the Trinity, the one who inhabits, who indwells our hearts, our lives, the, at the moment of regeneration, is grieved when we persist in putting on the old man. Paul goes back when he says in verse 22 that you are to put off and verse 24 to put on, but in the middle of that sequence of verse 23, that to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. So when Paul is talking about here in verse 30 that we are to grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. We grieve the Holy Spirit of God when we do not put on the new man, but insist and persist and keep putting on the old man. To the Corinthians, Paul had just 
been in chapter 6, Paul had been communicating about their lives. And, of course, he dealt with sexual fornication. And it's in that very passage that Paul says to flee fornication because he that commits fornication is sinning against his own body. Why is that important? Because notice what he says in the very next verse. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? which is in you. So we understand that the Holy Ghost at the moment of salvation is inside of us. Notice the next passage, Romans chapter 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. So if you're a child of God this morning, if you are saved, then the Holy Spirit has took up and taken up residency in your life. So if you know this morning the Holy Spirit lives within you, among all of the many other things that the Holy Spirit does and is in our lives, let me just give you a few more. We know that the Holy Spirit uh, is the one that teaches us. Notice John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I said unto you. Then notice the next passage. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he, the Holy Spirit, will show you things to come. So not only does the Holy Spirit teach us, but he also draws us to Christ. Notice John 16, verse 14. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So the Holy Spirit teaches us and, and then he draws us to Christ and he also helps us. Notice Romans chapter 8 verse 26. Likewise the Spirit also helps our infirmities for we know not what we should pray for as we ought but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So the Holy Spirit does many things in our lives. He helps us. He teaches us. He guides us. He draws us to Christ. But we understand first and foremost, he takes up residency in our lives. So we understand that, that the Holy Spirit then who indwells us, and because he is the third person of the Trinity, that the Holy Spirit has personality. Did you know that the Holy Spirit has feelings? Did you know that you can offend the Holy Spirit? Did you know that you can grieve the Holy Spirit? The word grieve here, he says, he says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Now, the word for grieve here in the Greek is lupeo, which means to make sorrowful. So you are, there is a way in which you can grieve, bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit. Now, I am a parent of four kids. As a parent, it brings so much joy when my kids all get together and love one another, they get along with one another. That's a wonderful thing as a parent, amen? But for any parent, what a, what a grief it might be when your kids are not getting along, when they're not cooperating, when they don't show love to one another, they're not getting along, they're unable or even unwilling. That grieves their heart, your heart as a parent. Think about this from the, from the vantage or from the perspective of, of God the Spirit and the fact that, that all, while all sin breaks God's heart, sin in the lives of his children causes him to grieve. He grieves when we lie, when we look at this passage in its totality or in the context, when we lie and do not tell the truth, we're grieving the Holy Spirit. When, when we are sinfully angry, we are grieving or bringing sorrow to the Holy Spirit. When we steal instead of share, uh, when, we, uh, uh, when we, we, we allow corrupt communication to come out of our mouth except, except for the words of edification, we are grieving or bringing sorrow to that of the Holy Spirit. So understand this morning that, that when you grieve the Holy Spirit of God, he is weeping as it were because of our not putting on the new man, but continuing to put on the old man. Understand, if you can grieve the Holy Spirit of God, that could also lead to you quenching the Spirit of God. Notice 1 Thessalonians 5.19, quench not the Spirit. 
Now, the idea of quenching is synonymous with extinguishing a fire. You understand that? That, that if, you are, if you are grieving the Holy Spirit of God, you can also quench the Spirit of God. What does that mean? That, that you are limiting God's power and blessing in your life. Notice Isaiah chapter 63. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. May I encourage you this morning, may I challenge you this morning, lest you get to that place of, of grieving the Holy Spirit, whereby uh, coming to a place where you are quenching the Spirit, that you are limiting or forfeiting God's power and blessing in your life. Now, you can bring sorrow and grief and pain to the Holy Spirit of God, but I want you to notice the second part of this verse, the promise that we see here, where he says, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, here, here's what Paul is saying here. I like how, I like how uh, J. Vernon McGee puts it. We can grieve the Holy Spirit, but we can never grieve him away. Understand that when it comes to our salvation, our salvation does not rest in whether or not we can grieve the Holy Spirit or not. Our salvation is not based upon our grieving the Holy Spirit because he assures us that we are sealed unto the day of redemption. What a promise that is that we can find that, that, uh, that our salvation is secured him. Why? Because our salvation has nothing to do with us. Amen? It has everything to do with him. And we understand that God gives us the Holy Spirit as a seal or as a promise of our eternal redemption. Notice here, if you want to go back with me to chapter number 1, where we are sealed unto the day of redemption, just go back a couple of pages to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, where Paul says, In whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. That word earnest is a deposit, a down payment. We understand that, that when you believed in Jesus Christ, that you are then sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The, the, the down payment has been, is God's seal of the Holy Spirit to confirm to us, as Romans 8, 16 says, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So the Holy Spirit is God's seal, his promise that we are eternally redeemed. But I want you to go back to chapter 4 here. Notice as we just take a look at this verse in its totality. When he says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So what Paul is saying here is that it is not that we are to avoid grieving the Holy Spirit to keep our salvation. We are to avoid grieving the Holy Spirit because of our salvation. Amen? Don't take for granted the promise of the eternal life that we have in Jesus Christ. Don't ever take for granted the promise that we have the Holy Spirit in our life and that we could never lose our salvation. Wearsby writes, we do not lose our salvation because of our sinful attitudes, but we can certainly lose the joy of salvation and the fullness of the Spirit's blessing. You know, when I, when I read that quote, it took me back to David when David had committed sin with Bathsheba and, and the, the events that followed with, with her husband Uriah. And, and of course, David was, was so heavily burdened and so broken because uh, of the sin that he had done. But notice what he writes in Psalm 51, 12. He says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Notice that he doesn't say restore unto me salvation, but rather the joy of thy salvation. So I can say to you this morning, if your life is bringing constant grief to the Holy Spirit, then I don't have to step out on a limb to wonder whether or not your life is filled with love and joy and peace. So grieving the Holy Spirit is the sorrow that we must avoid. Notice, secondly, we see the sin that we must abandon. The sin we must abandon. Now, the list of sins that we see here in verse 31, this takes us back to verse 22 of that which we are to put off. 
And, of course, now Paul says in, in, in verse 31 that these are things that are to be put away from you. You'll notice six particular items here. The first three are internal. The second three are external. I want you to get this this morning because when sin is in your life, sin will grow. Did you understand that? That when there is sin in your life, uh, it certainly will grow into greater sin if it's not dealt with. So let's look at the first set of sins to which Paul uh, emphasizes. He says bitterness and wrath and anger. So he starts with bitterness. Bitterness is really, it, it starts off in such a very small form. It really, it's like a, a root. Notice Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up inside of you trouble you and many be defiled. So bitterness starts off so small. It, it starts off as, as even a root. And, and, and roots, of course, they're under the surface. Roots are, are not seen. And as a matter of fact, though, roots, uh, as we understand, if you don't dig deep to pull out the root, it will grow and produce fruit. I read that bitterness is like a smoldering resentment, holding a grudge. I, uh, I think that if, if, here's how you can know if you're bitter. If you see somebody walking around, and they're smiling or they're laughing, and you say to yourself, I can't believe they're happy. Don't they know what they said to me? Don't they know what they did? That little bitterness can grow up inside of you to, to really be in spite or spiteful of, of, of somebody else's happiness. Or, or maybe uh, when you see them succeed, you would rejoice when they fail. Be careful of the bitterness. Maybe you know someone who is bitter. But then there's wrath and anger, and these, of course, are outbursts that come from within, the passion of the moment. Here, here's one of the differences between anger and wrath. Both of them are, are like an explosion of emotion, but, but anger will subside while wrath intensifies. We read about the wrath of God, and we understand that it's a lot more Intense. So I was thinking about, you know, really the idea of this, because it starts from within, it, it really lends itself to the idea of something that's boiling inside of you and eventually comes out. Now, let me give you an illustration. When I was, uh, you know, when you make pasta, how many of you guys are like, you like pasta out there? When you're making pasta, you will, uh, you boil the water, right? Put the pasta in the, uh, in the pot and, and I don't know if it's because of the starch or what it is, but there's a reaction that happens. As the water continues to boil, it starts bubbling up. And if you're not careful, if you don't continue to manage the noodles that's in that pot, the water then will spew out all over the stove. And some of you are shaking your head. Some of you are thinking, if you just use a larger pot, that wouldn't happen. Don't ruin the illustration, okay? Uh, but the whole, the whole idea is, is that it looks fine from the outside, but it's boiling, and at some point, it's just going to boil over. Have you ever wondered when someone just, just reeks out a, a, a sharp word or, or maybe just a burst of some sort of, or an outburst that it was, well, it's because it's been boiling inside of them, and now it's making its way out. Remember what we talked about before where Jesus said, whatever's inside the heart will come out through the mouth. And then that leads to clamor. Clamor, uh, we, we find the Amplified defines it as a perpetual animosity. The Greek word that we see here for, for this is, is really an outcry. And, and really, the idea of clamor, when you're clamoring, they're harsh words. They're, you're yelling at someone or, or, or raising your voice of some sort and uh, just loud that you are, you are clamoring. And, and maybe we don't uh, you really use the word clamor so much in, in our vocabulary, but we certainly are practicing in our lives when we're clamoring and when we're being yelling and, and, and really harsh words at someone. Let me give you the difference here. When it comes between clamor and the next one, evil speaking, Whereas clamoring is harsh words to someone, evil speaking is harsh words about someone. Evil speaking or slander is the ongoing defamation of someone. 
Here, here's the idea of evil speech or slander. Really, the idea of slander is when you are intentionally or giving misinformation or false information about someone else to hurt their reputation. Slander, right? We understand the word for, sl- for slander and the meaning of that. But, but Paul, Paul says to put this away from you. Now, if I were to go to, to Vaughn this morning and, and say, Vaughn, um, that, that Clyde, that guy, he's a, he's a great guy. And if, and if Vaughn were to say, oh, yeah, well, you don't know half of what I know about Clyde. And, and, uh, and so if, if he were to begin to say, well, let me just tell you a thing or two about Clyde. Uh, you know, he, he is just trying to hurt the, my, my understanding or my feelings of Clyde. And he's doing that intentionally to slander Clyde. You know, how many people will, will say something, well, well, I don't really know if this is true about so-and-so, but this is what I heard. Have you ever, have you ever heard a conversation like that? I don't, I don't, I'm just telling you this, and here's how we do it. Listen, I don't know if this is true, but listen, we need to pray. We need to pray because, you know, and, and certainly, you know, we'll tell everybody we know um, about this. And so I don't know if, it's, if this is true or not, but, but just pray, just in case. Well, that's evil speaking, slander. All of these are to be put away. And then he gets to the next one. He says, let all of these things be put away from you. But then notice, with all malice. So if Paul did not touch in an area uh, that is a problem in, in, in your life, he gets to this. It doesn't matter if there's anything else. If there's anything any desire to injure or to express ill will about someone, that's got to be put away as well. All of these things are to be put away. Imagine what our testimony would be like in the community, in our workplace, if they understood how we are treating one another. What kind of testimony do you have uh, in your community, uh, outside of these walls, outside of your homes, when people see how you're treating one another, how you are treating your brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul says these are the sins that we must abandon. Then notice thirdly, here are the steps that we must accomplish. Number three, the steps that we must accomplish. So what we are to put off, we see in verse 31. What we are to put on, we see here in verse 32 where he says, and be ye kind one to another. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. These are the graces in the Christian life that we are to demonstrate. These are the graces that we are to show to one another. If we get right down to it, God loved us, He chose us, and He forgave us, not because we deserved it, not because we earned it, but He did so by His grace. And if God is so gracious, how could we not be gracious to others? Notice what Romans chapter 5 says, but God commendeth, proved, demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So we have been shown love and grace towards us. We are to show love and grace to others. We are to demonstrate these graces in our life because we have been forgiven. We are to forgive others. Notice what Luke 6, 35 tells us. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. And you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. He's kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Be kind. Kindness. He says, be kind one to another. You know, it is normal for us to reciprocate. When when someone is kind to you, you can be kind back to them. You, we, we, we tend to return good for good, but don't we also render evil for evil? If your wife insults you or your husband insults you, don't you feel more inclined to insult them back? Yes? 
Or when they give you a word of, of a compliment that, you know, you'll receive that and maybe return that word in kind. That's normal for us. But what, what God is saying or what Paul is saying here is that, that more than, than to returning good for good, here's God's way, that we are to return good for evil. Notice Romans chapter 12. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, some of you saw that phrase. You said, I'd like to dump some hot coals over somebody's head. You know, as Paul mentions that, it really wasn't a practice in Paul's day so much. But the, but the idea, of course, is, is really, it, it goes back to Proverbs chapter 25. It, you know, Paul is quoting, actually, that phrase comes from Proverbs 25, 22. It's an ancient ritual. It's an, it's an ancient practice that when a person wanted to demonstrate their public contrition, they would put upon their head and carry it around a pot of burning coals. Why would they do that? They would do that to show their burning pain of the shame that they have been and their guilt that they have been living. So here's what Paul is saying. Here's the point. When we love our enemy and take care of them, when we love our enemy and genuinely seek to meet their needs, we are shaming them. That's what Paul's saying, that we are bringing shame upon their head that they cannot look to you and point their finger back to you, that you have mistreated them, but you are rather bringing shame upon them. Paul says, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. If you need any other incentive, look no further than the last part of verse 32. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Can I tell you this? Forgiven people should be the best forgivers. Amen? Because you have been forgiven, you are to forgive others. That's the, that's the motivation that Paul gives. Here's why we are to forgive others, because you've been forgiven. We find a parallel to these, really to this entire section of Scripture over in Colossians chapter 3. Would you turn with me to Colossians, flip over Philippians and then into Colossians. But Colossians chapter number 3 this morning. Colossians chapter 3, and join me in verse number 1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory." Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence or, or evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things or which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked sometime when you lived in them. But now, notice here the, the, the parallel to Ephesians, put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, Blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, Humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. You know, when we think about what Paul has been describing, for the last four weeks, all of the areas that we are to put off and what we are to put on, let me just close this morning with a personal illustration. So I had decided just a little while back that I want to give up drinking pop. 
I, it, just a personal choice, just to stop drinking so much pop. I was drinking a lot of pop. And then I started drinking less and less. A week would go by, maybe once or twice. I think the last time I drank pop was maybe a few weeks ago. And uh, when I drank pop for the first time in a long time, it actually felt different. It was uncomfortable, the, the taste, the, the, I don't know if it was the carbonation, it just kind of felt like it was burning going down. The less I drink pop, the less I desire having it. The less, the less I, I drink pop, the more I desire something else. It's not about what you put off, it's what you're putting on. And so I've been drinking other better choices and and feeling better because of it. But the whole idea is when I I put off drinking pop and put on drinking more uh, water and, and other choices that are better than pop, I find that I am now desiring the good and putting off the bad. Are you hearing me this morning? I want you to think about this in light of the new man and the old man. When you keep going back to the old man and you decide, I, I don't want to I don't want to go down that road anymore. I don't want to put on the old man. I want to take it off. The more you keep putting on the new man, the less you desire the old man. The more you put on the new man, the more satisfying and fulfilling that it is. We got to put off the old man. Now, as you look over the list this morning that Paul gives in the last seven or eight verses, maybe there's an area of your life that you've been struggling to put off. Or maybe you've not been so proactive in putting on. See, the whole idea of putting off and putting on is you have to replace one with the other. You cannot just take off the bad and do nothing. You have to take off the bad and put on the good. So if you're putting on the good and living it out, if your renewed thinking is leading to renewed living, you're going to be more satisfied with living the life of the new believer, of the new man, putting on that which is created after Christ, holiness. Of course, this morning, if you're here and you, if you understand that there's a part of your life that you've been struggling, there's a part of your life that you've you've been dealing with that just not bringing you joy or peace? Have you been grieving the Holy Spirit of God? Is there a part of your life through which you have been grieving God's Spirit who indwells your life? Or this morning, if if you're here and you say, "I've I've had zero guilt, I've had zero effect, I've had zero feeling of of conviction, maybe your step today that you need to take is to come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because it's not until the Holy Spirit comes to live within you, to to indwell you, that there then becomes that conviction for righteousness and and holiness. If you're here this morning and you're reveling, you're enjoying living the old life and doing things of the flesh, if you have no desire to live after things which are created after God, then I, I hope you would consider the fact that you may not be a child of God today that you would come to know Jesus as your Savior. We would be glad to show you how to do that. If you don't know, even today, if you if today was your last day on planet Earth and you do not know 100% for sure if you would go to heaven, we would love to show you from the very Word of God how you can know Jesus as your Savior today. Would you bow your heads with me this morning, every head bowed, every eye closed, with no one looking around. In a moment, we're going to have a time of reflection, time of invitation, a time where you can make a concrete decision for the Lord. What will you do? So unfortunate that we can hear the word of God and it has no effect in our lives. That we can hear what to do and what not to do and we make no decision. May I say that no decision that you make today, that actually is a decision. So what are you going to do today intentionally? What are you going to put on? What do you need to put off in your life? So as we pray this morning and we'll stand in a moment, I want you to think about and make your commitment to the Lord today. What will you do today? Father, I pray now 
have your will and way in our hearts, in our lives. Lord, I pray that as we think about your word and, Lord, all of the things that we are to put off, the things that come so natural to us, we have to be intentional. We have to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. And then we have to put on the new man, which requires equal intentionality. So, Father, I pray today that you will so show to us exactly what each person in this room needs to do today. What decision do we need to do to make today to become more like you? I pray in Jesus' name. Let's all stand together with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. As the music continues to play in the background, let's just take this time right now. Make your decision before the Lord. Let's settle up with God right now. Some of the events coming up, but uh, we are getting close to all of the great Christmas services. Is that your favorite time of year, Jai? Christmas time, and uh, we're looking forward to Christmas Eve, uh, Christmas Day. Uh, I, I had two people, two people in our church said, "Are are we having church on Christmas?" And I said, "Well, why why do we celebrate Christmas? Well, that's the birth of our Savior. Well, why would we not gather together on the day that's supposed to be about Him?" And uh, so we're going to have a great service planned for both Christmas Eve. That's a nice candlelight uh, communion service. It's beautiful. How many of you have never been to one of our candlelight communion services? Raise your hand. You've never been, Zach? You going to be here this year? All right, very good. Uh, it's going to be a beautiful service, and uh, we're looking forward to a great time, uh, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and then, of course, the kids' program uh, next Sunday. So plan on coming and inviting folks to come. Lord of John, ask the Lord's blessings on the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Lord, I just thank you for this day to be able to come worship you, dear Lord. I just uh, pray that we can uh, show each other the grace that you've shown us. Uh, just so thankful for that. I just pray that uh, if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, they would come to know you today and accept you as their Lord and Savior. I pray you bless this often, offering in your name. Amen.
So if you've taken a look at the bulletin, we have a few things going on this week. Uh, starting off with today, we do have the youth Christmas party. Directly after this, we're meeting out in the lobby, so don't allow them to run across the street. Stay over here. Uh, we're going to meet in the lobby, and then we're going straight to Culver's. I know we've been announcing this to the team for about six weeks. Doesn't mean it's come to you. So we are going to Culver's directly after this for lunch. Uh, after that, we will be here for the rest of the afternoon uh, for our Christmas party. Wednesday, we are still meeting with the youth as well. So Wednesday, same time, 5.30 to 7. The Sisters in Christ, they are meeting the next day on Thursday. So if you are interested, uh, 6 p.m. for Sisters in Christ party. Now we get to the kids' Christmas play program. Lots of things, lots of moving parts. For an example, if your kid has a speaking part, they are asking that they show up today at 430. So if your kid has a speaking part, please come, let's practice. After that, the next actual full play practice for every single kid is next Saturday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. So if your kid's any part of the kit Christmas program, please be here next Saturday between that time. Um, after that, we do have our family play the following day on Sunday, and then from there, a Wanda Christmas play or party store on the 18th. So if you could, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll be dismissed. God, thank you for your word and what you have to say. Thank you for the reminder that we need to be constantly vi vil diligent and with our hearts that we don't allow anger, resentment, or bitterness to seep in. God, if there is something in our heart, help reveal that, that anxiety or that offensive behavior that we are hiding in our hearts. God, but as Pastor was saying, and as your word reveals, it's not about just revealing it. It's replacing it with something better. God, allow us to replace that with your fruit of love and joy. God, we continue to, to lift you up because we know the only thing that can keep us moving is to remove ourselves and become more like you. God, thank you in your name. Amen.